Thank you for coming. Uh, we also welcome particularly Rob. It's been a Rob Mike Salt known for those who haven't met him as yet. Rob is the grower of our wonderful plants uh, that you've seen at the front. Uh, Rob's going to be talking at great length about them. There will be plenty of opportunities for Q&As afterwards and of all the wonderful things that Rob's going to tell you about, which when you form a queue to buy the plants afterwards, please form an orderly queue. We've got, there's plenty to go around. And Phil, thank you for running the, the info session to begin with. Much appreciated. Okay, um, I would also like to mention again um, membership of the Victorian Apris Association, which you know, we just call the VAA. They're the, the parent body of us, and if it wasn't for them, most of us would not be able to keep bees. The VAA, which used to be purely a commercial bee group organisation, lobbied long and hard to allow individual hobby beekeepers to keep bees. There was a lot of opposition from a great many councils over quite a lengthy period, but the VAA were the prime movers allowing us to keep bees. Um, I would highly recommend that you join the VAA as a member. They are our governing body and they do great work for us. They liaise with government, all the agencies, they do all the hard yard stuff for us. Um, Rob Waddell. Rob, if you could start making your way down to the front, please. Uh, yep, Rob's the grower. Oh, yeah, now, Beck and I were at a land care day earlier this year where Rob uh, was one of the presenters. The other one was Simon Williams, who's a PhD student looking into the properties of Manuka, that is Australian Manuka, uh, and he's with the University of the Sunshine Coast, isn't it, Rob? Yeah. So Rob will go into some detail about that as well. Now, there'll be plenty of opportunities for questions and answers at the end. I know a lot of you are going to have so many questions. Can we just see if we can let Rob go through what he's got for us and there'll be plenty of time for Q&As afterwards and he's only too happy to share his wealth of information with us. So, without further ado, Rob Waddell. Okay, so thanks for having us along. Um, we've got a little nursery opening at Warrigal. Um, I think this is probably our eighth talk about leptospermum. We're in various corners of the state at this stage. There's still a few more to come, so if you miss out or you need some more, um, there's plenty of other opportunities. So our business name is Grand Ridge Propagation. We're like a 16 k south of Warrigal, in the Spurs Lickies. We've got, we're on a farm, so we've got sheep, cattle, horses, and more recently we've got a couple of beehives as well. So we've brought the bug along with you guys, and we're having the wonderful joy of trying to figure out these little creatures. Um, our nursery is our bread and butter. This year we're producing about 130,000 seedlings in total. It's about half and half split between tube stock and uh, Lyco trays, which you see out there on the tables. We don't just brew leptospermums, we do a range of foot wide range of eucalypts, calistamins, wattles, malalukas, and other bits and pieces as well, which total up to about 70 species in total, all the, range, all the way from metre high grasses up to mountain ash, which can grow to about 100 metres. And this year we, we did about 2,000 um, leptospermum last year. This year we got a bit excited and grew about 30,000 of them. So you guys are helping us to move along a few of those today, so thank you very much. And we're one of only four nurseries in the country at this stage which is actually doing the testing for the bioactivity in the leptospermum. So there's a lot of nurseries out there selling scopariums and jellybush and the other tea trees, but we're only one of four, um, according to the, the Sunshine Coast people, that are actually involved in the nursery and doing the nectar testing. Okay, so why would anyone worry about leptospermum? If you're a honey producer, um, this is a little photo I took at um, Tullamore Airport. If you can't quite make it out, that's 250 grams of um, tea tree honey, and that's a price tag there for 60 bucks. So at, at a retail level, that's 240 bucks a kilo at Tullamore. Um, you probably won't get that everywhere, but it's still considerably more than um, what you get for your normal clover and gum tree honey. On top of that, uh, the leptospermum honey, if it's the right grade, it's got some pretty heavy um, antibacterial properties that have got the potential to kill um, bugs like golden staff. So if there's any health people, doctors, nurses, all that kind of stuff in the room, um, there's antibiotic resistance occurring in hospitals these days where there's bacteria that penicillin just isn't killing anymore and it's getting resistant to it. And they found that uh, the leptospermum honey, not just the manuka, but the leptospermum as well, 
can um, actually kill golden staff as a wound in topical dressing. So it's pretty important in that respect. Um, I touched on the, the price difference. Um, Australia, we've got a lot of open ground that has got potential to be planted out for leptospermum. There's also natural occurrences of tea tree right up the, up the coastlines. Uh, unfortunately, not all of it's active, and I'll go into that in a sec. And everyone's heard of Manuka, it's sort of the poster boy as far as tea tree honey goes. Um, New Zealand's got one species of leptospermum, and Australia's got 83. So there's a, a far wide ranging gene pool for Australia's tea tree to be tested and to find out which ones are and aren't as active and which ones have got potential for plantation production as well. There's not all active um, tea trees necessarily going to be good for plantation type settings. Right, now everyone on the way out will get tested on these two terms. Um, the first one is DHA or dihydroxyacetone and it's found in the nectar. So we're not running around testing my little nectar um, tea tree flowers. I mean, these are the seeds on there, but they would have had flowers beforehand. We're actually looking for the DHA in the nectar. And that's measurable by um, the, the labs. You can't do it yourself, unfortunately. So we send the, the nectar samples up, which is a tiny, tiny, minuscule amount of nectar itself. But they can um, ascertain whether it's a really high testing plant, a low testing plant, or in some cases, zero. So they don't all have the DHA in the nectar. Um, the second one, a bit easier to say, is NGO, and that's what's found in the actual honey itself. That's what's the antibacterial properties, uh, methyl glyoxal. Okay, so this one's courtesy of Simon Williams. Um, Greg mentioned these in before. Uh, this guy's running around pretty much all over the country testing leptospermum wherever he can. He's doing a PhD on the bioactivity of Australian leptospermum honeys and the nectars. So Simon's doing the, the nectar side of things and there's someone else that's doing the, um, the honey testing. And he's worked out that if the, the DHA does get converted over to NGO in the hive over a period of time, and these are the levels that in a lab setting, so this is not the, um, in a field setting, it's probably going to be a bit lower because there's going to be nectar contamination coming from eucalypts, clovers, other weeds and whatnot. Um, it gives you a rough idea if you've got a, a DHA in the plant roughly where it's going to come across as a MGO in the, in the honey. So um, medicinal grape honey kicks in at about 400, so it's somewhere in amongst there, which is about that 3,000 um, DHA level. The stronger the, the DHA, the stronger the antibacterial properties in the honey. Now these two over here is some um, marketing talk. Uh, the UMF is the unique Manuka factor, which is a New Zealand trademark. That's why it's got this little TM after it. So there's a group of New Zealand honey producers that are involved with the Manuka and they've worked out a grading system of 5 plus, 10 plus, etc. to rate the, the various honeys. And that has been correlated to, um, in an Australian setting, because we can't use the same figures, to MPA, which is non-peroxide activity. So in other words, honey's got um, peroxide in it, which also has bacterial, any bacterial properties. But what we're looking at with the leptospermum is the non-peroxide or the MGO activity on that side of things. So those two numbers, if it's MPA or UMF, will be the same. And that gives you a rough idea of where the DHAs can roughly correlate to the MGOs. So basically, the more DHA in the nectar and the, the seedlings, the better potential you've got to produce a high MGO and therefore a high value honey. Okay, so why would we need a plantation based industry in Australia? The first one is New Zealand can't meet supply and they're already not meeting supply. The wild population in New Zealand is fully stocked with beehives and their production is at the limit. Any additional production coming from New Zealand from the, um, the Manuka is going to come through plantations. In Australia, we've also got lots and lots of tea tree. Um, the best of it is probably up in the southern Queensland, northern New South Wales area. As soon as people start figuring out where those sites are, they will also be very, very heavily stocked because the honey is worth a lot of money. Um, and there's only so many beehives you can stick on a hectare. I'll touch on that one a bit later on. Um, but there is finite resources to this. So you can't just keep stacking the beehives on on, on the, the wild resource before there's not enough food to go around for the bees and you don't end up getting good yields. Um, the other side of the plantation side of things is we can go into the bush and test individual plants to see which ones are the, the best testing. So you can look at a plant 
in the size of this room, there might be 20 of them, and you can test each one. There's going to be a range from you know, almost zero to really high testing plants, depending on the, the species. And we can isolate those individual plants and collect seed from those individual plants. And that's what we're looking at doing down the track. So from a plantation perspective, we're cutting out the bottom 90% of the, the DHO levels and just picking out that top 10%. We're going to keep breeding from those top 10%, top 10% to keep the, the DHO, DHO levels up really high. So in a plantation setting, if you've got all these elite plants and nothing else, the DHO levels in your nectar and therefore your honey potentially are going to be a lot higher. Um, the other side of it is that the, the market is nowhere near saturated for this stuff. I think there's something like four times as much Manuka honey being sold in the world at the moment than actually actually produced. So it's about three quarters of the Manuka honey is actually counterfeit. Um, they're working on some um, genetic testers to figure out which ones are actual Manuka and leptospermia and which ones aren't. And there's another chemical in amongst all the um, leptospermum honey, which is called leptospermin, which is exclusively from um, leptospermin plants and not from other sources. So if it gets diluted too much, the leptospermin levels drop and they can tell it's actually counterfeit. Okay, now this one, you've got some white tea trees around here. If you were to walk outside there, you're going to find this fella, which is, comes here, Ericordes. And on my way here, that's mainly what I saw. Now it used to be um, part of the leptospermin family, it got separated off about 10 years ago and got switched over to Acunzia. Um, the common name is the Bergen and it has got zero bioactivity. So if you've got a, a mixed plantation uh, or a mixed wild site that's got some, some of the wild tea trees mixed up with the Acunzia, um, the, the value of the, the DHA levels are going to be dropped due to nectar contamination coming across from the Acunzia. We've also got leptospermin grandiflorum, which is the mountain tea tree. They've been way up in the Alps there somewhere. I've never actually seen any. I've never hunted for any because it's in pretty remote sort of spots. But some of you guys in the room might know where some is. Um, Leptospermum mercenoides or the heath tea tree. That looks a little bit like the ericoides in its leaf structure. Um, that's also got zero activity. Leptospermum continentale is the prickly fella. So he's got a really, really spiky leaf and if you can grab him, you'll really know that there's that one. Now the average DHA coming from Simon's tests over the last couple of years has come in about 3,800 for that species. So that's in that food grade level of um, honey production. And the other one, which Greg brought a lot, piece along today, is Leptospermum like linigerum. That's a nice little soft fella. And his DHA is coming in about 3,500. So he's another local species. You'll find him along a creek line somewhere. Right, so this season we're growing four species. Um, we're growing the poster boy, which is the Scaparium or Manuka. We've brought that seed in from New Zealand. We've got a North Province and a South Province. The North Island, North Province is from the North Island and the South from the South Island. Both of them tested out about that 300 to 500 MGO honey. So that's not the nectar, it's actually the honey that's been tested in that respect. And that comes in at the top end of the food grade level into sort of the, the lower to mid range of the medicinal grade honey. So that's the Manuka seedlings outside there from the table. Um, these guys are all pretty much shrubs, most of the tea trees. This bloke grows about three to five metres. And generally speaking, you're growing no flower in November and December. And there's a lot of garden varieties which will flower a lot earlier. I've got one flowering at home right now for some strange reason. But a lot of the garden ones tend to go a little bit earlier, so they may not be as active as far as the bees go. Um, the bees have a bit of a slumber in sort of that August, September period. By the time the, the bees wake up and there's a bit more warmth, they're sort of ready to go for that November, December period. So the seed ones could be better in that respect from the, um, the cutting grain lines and the garden ones. Now we tested a red flower one last year and we had a couple of trays out there and they tested about 500 DHA, which is a fairly low testing one. It's still active, but it's a fairly low active um, variety. The second one is a bit of a tongue twister. Um, jelly bush is the common name. The botanical name is Leptospermum polygallifolium. Now there's five subspecies of this bloke. Uh, the polygale subspecies polygale is the uh, more southern um, reach of the, the spread, the species. They run all the way up to about Cairns, which is a different subspecies again. Um, these guys are a little bit taller, about three to seven metres, depending on your soil. Uh, I've seen some on the edge of Warrigal, they're about five metres. Um, they flower similar sort of time to the Manuka. So you've got a November, December flowering window there, although there is always a bit of genetic variation in that respect. Um, one of the plants I tested at Warrigal was flowering in January and February, so he was just way up 
play at normal. Um, a lot of it, unfortunately, tested pretty low. That would have been a pretty interesting plant to break from. Now we've got our seed this year from the Sunshine Coast, um, bottom of Queensland, and that has been a bit of a hot spot from Simon and the honey testing perspective for Australia's bioactivity. So they've drawn little maps about where the high testing plants are coming from, and there seems to be this cluster up around that northern rivers of New South Wales, southern Queensland, where there's a lot of activity from, and that's where we've got our polygal seed from this year. Next one we're growing is the, the woolly tea tree, Lepospermum lenitrum. That's one of your local blocks. Flowers October, November, so it is a fair bit earlier than the other two species. So we've got a three month window, just by including that extra species in there now. Uh, we source our seed locally, or to us anyway, that's West Gippsland. Um, the feature of this bloke is he will stand it really, really, really wet. So this guy can stand total inundation, boggy sort of conditions where not much else will grow. Um, in an area like this, you're also going to get away from, away from the from the creek lines because you just got enough rainfall to sustain the, the plants growing um, away from the creek lines. This year they tested out about 2,000. Um, next year we tested one up the road, which tested at about 5,500 DHA. Um, since I made the slide, I've been contacted from people up around Wangaratta and they've tested some plants up around that 10,000 level. So we're pretty keen to jump up to Wang and run around their little patch of bush and test their plants as well and see if we can find those really, really high testing plants. So the 5,500 is well and truly in that medicinal grade um, of honey production. The so fourth species we've got this year is Contentale, or the prickly tea tree. We grow about three to five metres. He's probably not quite as heavy flowering as the other three species. The other three, when they're flowering full on, you just almost can't see the foliage. And they become really distinctive just because of the, the pure massive flower they've got. This bloke's a little bit lighter in the flower production. Um, he flowers after Christmas. That's one of the main reasons we look at this guy, um, this species, to add to the mix. Because if you've got um, some other species that are flowering before Christmas, like eucalypts, or you've got a massive clover or weeds or whatever's going on, um, so there's going to be nectar contamination before Christmas. If we've got this species in the mix, the bees can be collecting on it without having the um, nectar contamination from those pre-Christmas species. This year we sourced it from West Gippsland, it tested out about 1400 DHA, so that's food grade um, honey. Um, next year we ran around a quarry around Glengarry somewhere and we found a few about the 2100, so still that food grade, not quite into the medicinal grade. So that's where we're at with this bloke. Right on. So with all that knowledge, how do we make it work? So there's a few factors. Um, the first one is the plants have got to be genetically active. You can't turn a non-active plant into an active plant by sticking it in a different soil. If the plants and the genes just aren't there in the first place for activity, you can't make them better and vice versa. Second one is we really in a plantation setup, we need lots and lots of yield, lots and lots of flowers to make an economic viable. There's a couple of species, um, Leptospermum speciosum and white eye come to mind. Their DHA is around about that 16,000 level um, as a species average. They're from southern Queensland, northern New South Wales, but they're really, really low flowers. So we might do a bit of a test run on them to see whether they work down here and how they flower in southern Australia. Um, but if they just haven't got the yield of flowers, they're not going to produce the nectar for the bees to forage off, which is not going to produce enough yield for, the, for a viable production of honey. Whereas the polygol and the scoparium and even the linigerum, they're really, really heavy, heavy flowers, lots of nectar lots of yield, lots of honey at the other end of it. Um, plant density, I'll touch on that one a bit later on, but you also want to have in a plantation set up the right spacing to the plants. You don't want them too tight, you don't want them too far apart because else you will lose, you lose your yield. Um, the, first one, the last point there is a really, really important one. If you take nothing else from today, remember this one. Um, if you're going to produce medical grade honey, make sure it's the principal source of nectar at the time when the plants are flowering. So if you've got a heap of eucalypts flowering at the same time, the bees might nick off and grab some eucalypt flower and bring it back to the, um, the hive as well. That's going to lower your test level in the eventual honey. So if the leptospermum is the main pl plant that's flowering at the time when your bees are out there foraging, you're going to get those higher DHA levels because there's going to be less nectar contamination coming from other sources. Okay, so how many plants do you need to make it work? Sure. I always start at the end and work backwards from that. Um, if you're planting out wing rates and you're only going to plant tea trees and nothing else, stick them about two metres apart. 
Same with hedges, it'll work out pretty well. You can go a little bit closer if you want to in a hedge, if you want to keep them down a bit lower. In a mixed species windbreak, it's also got eucalypts and malaleucas and a few other species in there. Um, stick them about three metres apart just to give them that little bit more breathing space. In a plantation setup, there's sort of two situations where you might come across. Um, one's if you want to slash it or graze it with sheep underneath. Um, I have mentioned sheep there and not cattle and horses. Cattle and horses are more browsers and they will absolutely smash your tea tree plantation if you've nurtured long for several years. They'll just tear it to bits and it'll be a waste of time. So keep cattle, horses, all those bigger animals, goats as well as another one, um, heavy, heavy browsers. You want to keep them out of the uh, plantation tops out. With, uh, with sheep grazing, it's probably better off if you're going to just stick them in and stick them out. It's a crash grazing type situation rather than a set stocking situation. So if they don't get hungry enough, they're going to start browsing off the, brow off, uh, the bushes and lowering your, your leaf and your flower yield. If you're going to go down this path, stick them about five to six metres apart or whatever your, your tractor slasher um, width is. That's another way of working it out. So at a five to six metre path, um, Spacing works at about 400 to 300 metres uh, plants per hectare. So a hectare is 100 metres by 100 metres. If you want to totally plant out the site, stick them about three metres apart, and that works out at 1,150 plants per hectare. Now that's exactly the same um, spacing that they use in agroforestry. So you might be thinking, well, why don't we just stick them closer together because they're smaller plants, they're not going to grow to 20 metres. Um, the reason behind that is we want the plants to spread out and create a big surface area for um, leaf production and flower production. So if you're stuck them about a metre apart, and you're planting about 10,000 plants per hectare, which would be really lot, um, you're gonna get a canopy of flowers. And you're only gonna get that surface area on top of the, the plantation where the plant the bees can forage from. If you plant them about that three metres apart, it gives the plants enough room to spread out and produce flowers and leaves all around the plant. So the surface area and the amount of leaf and therefore the amount of flower you can produce off them is far higher at that rate. If you go out to a four metre spacing, you're going to get gaps between the plants and you're going to reduce the amount of total yield you can get. Um, those figures are on the pamphlet there as well, if you want to go over later on. Okay, so I've got our plantation, now it's time to stick the bees in. So the honey, it takes about 12 to 18 months for the DHA to be converted over to the NGO to its full level. So if, when you first take the honey um, out and spin it out of the, the hive, out from the combs, it will have a high level of DHA, a little bit of MGO, but that's not your final MGO figure. So you've still got another 12 to 18 months of waiting, if you like, before the, the MGO levels reach their peak, and then they'll plateau at about that 12 to 18 month period. Beyond that, they don't go up much more. Now you can test for, if you send off a honey sample, you can get the DHA levels tested on the honey initially when you first spin it out and that'll give you a bit of an idea whether it's worth carrying through or not. If your DHA levels are fairly low, the MGO is not going to flow from nothing, so you might be better off just selling it um, straight away rather than going through the cost of the um, storage. Now these fellows can be very, very difficult to extract. Um, the word sticky stuff has been used quite heavily. Um, stuff's an acronym. Um, there's a little spiky roller, which I think I saw on Beck's um, website or on a Facebook page or something like that. It actually punctures the individual cells and releases the honey a lot better when it gets spun out. So there's these little spikes you roll up and down on the frames and that um, releases the honey a lot better. Um, the, the temptation can be to heat it up, but that'll decrease your final bio, bioactivity of the honey in the end. It knocks out the heating, knocks out the DHA, which will therefore affect your um, honey test down the, down the track. Now, if you've got a flow hive, um, there's some bad news. You, you can have low levels of leptospermum and honey in it, but as soon as it gets to about 50%, the stuff won't come out. So the, the honey is so thick that when you, you switch your little mechanism, it just stays there because it's really almost jelly-like. That's why they get the name jelly bush, I think, because it produces a, a jelly-like honey. Have that been tested, has it? Yeah, the flow people. Yeah. Yeah, they said that. They stuck them on some 50% um, jelly bush up in northern New South Wales and the stuff wouldn't come out. And that's about the 50% mix. So a pure plantation setup, you're gonna end up with a gelatinous mess in your side your flow hive, and yeah, won't quite work. Now, yield wise, um, this is the New Zealand experience because we haven't got any plantations in Australia to speak of so far. Um, they've been getting yields of up to 40 kilos per hive for their eight to 10 week flowering window. Remember, they've only got Sparrow, they haven't got all these other species that we can tack on either end of that. 
and stock and grow in the wild. They work on about one hive per hectare. And in the, the full yielding plantations, when they've been going for about seven, or eight, ten years, they've run them up to about four hives per hectare. If I was doing my budgets, I wouldn't do it on 40 kilos. I'd do it on a bit less and be conservative. And I wouldn't be working on the maximum stocking rate. I'd be working on a lower stocking rate just to give yourself a, um, a bit of wriggle room there to make it work. Site prep. Um, this is a site in Warrigal that me and the kids and the school kids planted out a couple of years ago. We actually planted out some of the in, on that site. I can't tell you which ones they are because they're all hiding. Um, within two years, because it was a really, really, really wet site, some of those plants are up as high as the projector there, and they're actually flowering. So in a really saturated, <coughs> wet spot, the, the growth rates of these plants are fairly considerable. And they had a light flower, it wasn't a heavy flower, it was sort of gone within about a month. But you know, within two years, these guys were flowering on that site. Now the best time for planting out, just like any other revegetation project you're going to do, or plantation project, is about now. So the the weather's cooling off a little bit, the moisture levels are starting to build up in the ground, although it's running very slow this year. So the, the wettest, coldest time of the year is actually the best time to get these trees going. Um, the main reason for that is you don't have to water them. So the, as long as the seedlings are wet in their pots when you stick them in the ground, there should be enough rainfall coming for the next three, four, five months to get those seedlings, their roots out and the plants established before you have to start thinking about watering. And hopefully, they'll be established enough that you don't have to. Are they deep rooted or shallow rooted? In between, um, they're shrubs, so they're not going to be as deep rooted as a eucalypt, but they hang on. Um, these so things don't blow over very easily. Clay or they, clay? Pretty much any soil site. Yeah, they're pretty versatile, and the natural range of these species is so wide. That's always a bit of an indicator about how a species is going to perform in different soil types. So if you've got a, a natural range of a species, which is you know just this local area, there's a fair chance there's only those local conditions are going to suit it. Um, Scoparium grows in the Grampians, the Otways, up the coast of New South Wales, pretty much all over New Zealand. Polygallifolium starts about um, Bega, runs all the way up to Cairns. So they're very widespread species. Um, probably the most particular one is the Lanigerum, because that needs that bit of moisture. But around here, you're going to get enough rainfall, enough moisture, even going to plant it off those creek lines. Do they like sunshine or...? I'll get onto that one in a second. Yep. Um, weed control. They're only little babies at the moment. The little seedlings, so it's probably a good idea to either mulch or hit them with a bit of Roundup where you're going to spray just to knock out the weed competition. Uh, mulching will also add a bit of. Um, <laughs> if you're doing 10,000 of them, you might want to mulch 10,000. Um, but the mulch will also get the benefit of um, locking in the moisture, and the dead grass does that as well. Um, but only do an area where you're going to mulch about a metre across. That will let the grass grow up around it and come summer. You'll have nice long grass and it'll look horrible, but it's also going to be shading the seedlings. So they're going to be keeping the wind off them, all that long grass around will keep the wind off them and keep the sun off them so the seedlings can do a bit better. Don't need as much moisture. Pest control, rabbits are always good fun. Um, we use these milk carton tree guards. They're biodegradable. They don't tend to blow away in the wind. The plastic guards that everyone's been using for a long time I've got no idea, apart from putting four stakes in every single one, um, how to make them stay put. Um, we've used thousands and thousands of these things over the last few years, and it might be a fraction of 1% which actually blows away. The other advantage is they rot down, so they don't have to remove them, and the plant's strong enough to break out and do its own thing, whereas the plastics, they end up in cow's guts, they end up on neighbour's fences, and it can be a bit of a mess. Um, wallabies. Wombats, kangaroos, deer, um, they're a lot more aggressive than your, your, your little rabbits. Um, hares is another one. The hares should be covered by these guards. Um, if you've got the other browsing species like wallabies and kangaroos and the like, we can actually apply a, a spray onto them, which is an egg based with a little bit of glue, and then we sprinkle metal filings on them, and that gives a sort of about an eight week window provided the rain doesn't, isn't too heavy. And it gives a real prickle factor to uh, the seedlings when they're establishing. It just gives them enough chance to get their roots out so that the plants can get up and going. Um, the only catch with that one is once the plants have grown out, unless you're going to reapply the stuff, they're sort of on the open market to the, the grazing animals after that. Um, touch on the mulching and the weed mats. If you've got wombats, please don't use weed mats. They really, really, really don't like them. 
Um, anything that disturbs the soil or is different to the natural environment, the wombats are pretty aggro about because it's, it's change. And I've heard of these things being placed out and it takes a long time. And the wombats come back the next day and they're just pulling at them and pulling at them and taking the seedlings with them. So if you've got wombats around, the weed mats aren't such a good idea, stick with your mulch. Uh, watering side of things, around here you should get away with um, not watering at all as long as you plant them in the next month or so. So while it's cold and wet and miserable, you don't want to go out and plant, go out and plant them because it'll be the best thing for the plants in the long term. Um, it'll save you a lot of water in come summer. It's a really, really um, early cutout to the season. You may have to top them up in that first summer to get them going. Now fertilizer wise, these guys are actually related to gum trees and bottle brushes. The native plants have got the really high uh, phosphorus sensitivities are in the Grevillea family and the Hakeas and the ones like that, um, Luke Isopogons and that sort of family. So they can't handle much phosphorus. Um, every seedling out there has been grown with just a general Osmocote fertiliser and some of them at a fairly high rate just to get them going faster. So we haven't noticed any fertiliser sensitivities with the leper spoon and I'd imagine unless you went really, really overboard, you're not going to have any issues with the fertiliser. In fact, fertilising could actually get them growing a little bit quicker and get a higher yield. Okay, a few other things to keep in mind. Um, the plants won't flower next week, they won't flower next year. Um, unless it's a really, really good site, like the, the one we showed in the previous slide, you're probably waiting about three or four years before you start getting flowers on the plants, and they'll be a moderate level of flowering. They hit their full peak after about six years, seven years. This is going off New Zealand experience, because we haven't been doing it long enough in Australia. And the plantation goes for about 30 years. So it's almost like agroforestry in a way, except with cash flow. So agroforestry, you plant your tree, 20 years later you get your, um, your log, 25 years later you get your saw log. With a leptospermum plantation, you've got to wait a few years between that first lead time, but you've got a regular income coming in after for the next 20, 25 years, which is pretty good. Um, make sure the species is suitable for the site. Most of them are very, very versatile, as I touched on before. Uh, the main one you'll have to be more specific about, it's probably not so much around this area because you're rainfall, is lanterum, make sure it gets enough moisture. Soil types, um, they can handle full coastal exposure. One thing they won't like is salinity. So if you've got saline water underneath or a bare saline patch, it'll kill them. And you're probably better off just doing a normal revegetation um, type project in that respect. Now, as far as um, shading and the amount of sunlight in goats, um, the general rule of thumb is the more sun you can give your plants, the more flowers you're going to get. And you would have noticed that in your garden setting. So if you've got the plant, same plant in a different spot, one's in full sun, one's in full shade, you're going to get a lot more flowers and a lot more growth and a lot more vigour out of the plant that's in the open. So if you've got a north facing slope and a south facing slope, you're going to get a lot more vigour on the north facing slope compared to the south facing slope as well. And if you're going to plant them under gum trees, you're not going to get as many flowers and as much production out of them as what you will if they're out in the full, full open sunshine. So rule of thumb, the more sun you can give them, the better. Now planting in urban areas, if you're in the middle of a town, like Lulao, um, bees, as you'll know, don't just stick to your backyard. They'll go about a K, two Ks from your yard. I reckon if you were to plant, say, just pick a number, 20 tea trees in your backyard, the nectar from those 20 trees is going to be so diluted by the time your bees go around and run around all your neighbours and your neighbours' neighbours and bring up all the nectar back into the into the hive, by the time all that's happened, I reckon your your test levels are going to be really, really low. It might be all right for um, your own purposes, but if you're looking to sell it, I've, I've just got this feeling it's going to be really, really low because there's going to be so much nectar contamination. So I'm not sure a plantation or a high level of honey production is going to be capable of being produced in an urban setting. So, sorry about that for the town guys. I think it's more for the rural, semi-rural areas. Um, pest and diseases. There's probably two that the, the tea trees are more prone to. One is a little black sticky mould. Now, that one tends to happen more often when there's not much air circulation or they're not getting a lot of sunshine. So, it's more of a, a cold, damp, wet type scenario where the plants are. So, if we're going to keep, give them plenty of sunshine and plenty of air circulation, um, that one's probably not going to be a problem. The other one they tend to get is a tiny little webbing caterpillar, which is about a centimetre long and smaller than a pencil lead it's in its width. And it sort of creates what always looks like a little spider web. And there's this little fellow in the side there, very chewing away on the leaves and that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, it's not enough to cause a significant problem um, for large scale production of plants. They'll just have a chew on a little bit here and a little bit there. 
and they won't cause too much troubles. Now, on the fire side of things, it's pretty important to consider in Australia. Um, these guys do have, they are related to eucalypts. They have got oils in their, um, in their leaves. So if you were in a fire, these guys are probably gonna burn really, really good. So make sure in the planning session, um, when you're st starting to think about these things, uh, make sure your tea trees, if you're gonna plant lots of them, are well away from your house and any structures you might have as well, so shedding and the likes of that. So keep them, you know, make sure you've got a good fire break between your plantation and your, your structures. Right, a couple of extra tips. This is actually a photo of the only time I've ever seen my queen bee. There she was there, I've never seen her since. I know she's still there, she's still weighing, but I've never seen her. Okay, so when you've got your leopard sperm plantation and they're just starting to come into flower and you're thinking beauty, we're gonna make a go of it. Um, make sure you've got your hives at full strength, okay? Feed them up or make sure they're on a good leading um, feeding period before going on to leopard sperm. So if you've got a big, big workforce ready to go out, harvest the nectar and then drag it back to the hive. If you've only got little weak hives, there's just not gonna be the workforce there to go out, gather the nectar and bring it back. So your yields are gonna be lower. Um, use drawn out frames, does everyone know what that is? That's when the, the comb's already out, it's already pre-spun um, honey frames. That way you're not wasting half your time. The bees bring back all the nectar and the energy to draw out the frames before they start putting nectar away. So you want them to just go out there, grab the nectar, bang it in the, in the frames, so you're getting the maximum um, potential to get for that flowering window. Swarm control, um, I'm not a beekeeper, but I do know, or well, not a beekeeping expert, but I do know you don't want half your workforce nicking off halfway through a leptosperm flowering, because that'd be really counterproductive to your final product. Um, so make sure all your swarm control measures are in, in place between, um, yeah, prior to and leading up to, and including the um, period when they're flowering. I'll let other people talk about that one more, but just keep it in mind as, a, as an issue. Now, leptospermum are reasonable producers of nectar, but they are really, really bad producers of pollen. So if you're going to have them on leptospermum for an extended period of time, so the, the general window is about eight weeks, if you start mixing species and go out further, or out to about five months, just with the mix we've got out on the table, um, you're going to have to top them up with pollen and other supplements in order to keep the hive strong. If they're only just getting the nectar from the tea tree and nothing else, the hive is going to gradually dwindle off, and by the time you come out, it's going to be not, not a very strong hive. That's going to affect your end result as well. So a top up with some pollen would be good and some other supplements as needed. Now pruning wise, tea trees flower on second year wood. So this guy here flowered this season. So that's this year's season's flowering. That's the new growth he's put on since. Um, that's where he's going to flower next season. That, that bear where he's flowered there would have been that the season before. So if you're going to trim them up and make them into a hedge, just keep in mind that if you trim it really, really heavily, you're probably going to be cutting off most of next season's wood. So before they flower in those formative few years, trim them as much as you want. Just about every seedling out there at the moment has been trimmed already, trying to get those lateral shoots going, just to get a denser plant. Um, you can trim them as much as you want before they start flowering to get a really dense, vigorous plant. But once they start flowering, probably just keep pruning at the best is going to be what's required. Um, if it's in a garden setting and you're just looking at a hedge, it's probably not so important. Now, one potential for um, beekeepers is for a profit share type arrangement with people that don't want bees because there's the whole sting thing. And, but they do want to generate some income off some um, you know, sort of marginal ground. So if we go back to the slide before, that's the right way. In fact, we're planting a couple of thousand of these this year in a, a hill that looks an awful lot like that. Um, we don't want to be chasing cattle or sheep or that down there for the next 20 years. Um, but we think we can generate some income from that land a lot safer for livestock um, through tea, um, tea trees and bees. So if you know some people around um, that have got some land that are thinking about planning out or doing something with it, um, this might be an arrangement you can come to where you share the income from the, the leptospermum and honey. Now what's been working in New Zealand is about a 30% split for the, um, the landholder and about a 70% split for the, the beekeeper. All right, almost there. A um, couple of myths. The soil type affects the bioactivity. Um, it actually doesn't. The bioactivity is set in, gen in the genetics. Just like I've got a certain set of genes, no matter where you stick me, I'm going to have the same set of genes. The plants are the same. 
um, I might perform better where it's cold and damp as compared to the desert, um, whereas a, someone else might have a better set of genes to perform in the desert. But um, the bioactivity of the plants is is locked in with the genetic of the plants. What's going to vary is the, the yield and production you can get. So that's where the suitability of the species comes down to um, the soil type. But it won't affect the, the bioactivity. Uh, Fertiliser sensitivity, I touched on that one before. I think unless you go really, really stupid and really, really pile on the fertiliser, it's not going to be too much of a problem with these colours. Um, another one is that the flower colour is an activity, um, an indicator of bioactivity. There's no correlation between the prettiness of the flowers or the size of the flowers and the activity. The only way you can actually do um, figure out whether they're active or not is to test them. And does that cost a lot, the testing? Um, at the moment it's free because it's um, been worked with uh, the University of Sunshine Coast and same with honey samples. So if someone's got a, a leptospermum honey sample, you can send it up to the um, Sunshine Coast University and get it tested at the moment for free. I think that's running out next year. So I'm looking to do a, a lot of nectar testing in the next 12 months while it's still free. Um, I've been told that it, the recovery cost is about 200 bucks a nectar sample for um, yeah, the costs involved. So it's not a simple test, it's actually quite detailed and there's quite a few on costs involved in it. Okay, so what's next for us? Um, we're going to stick in about 2,000 of these guys on our place this year. Uh, they'll be a mixture of mainly polygal and um, scoparium. The reason we're going with those two species is the eucalypts around us are mainly manigums, blue gums, mountain grey, mountain ash and messmate. So most of the, the messmate and the mountain ash flower after Christmas. So we don't want to cross over with that flowering time. The manigums, the, the blue gums are really early. It's sort of early, early winter, uh, late winter, sorry, early spring. Uh, the mountain gums are a little bit later in the spring, but it's not going to clash with that November, December flowering time we want our tea tree going full gas. So that's, that's why we're sticking those two species, not the others. Um, we're probably going to do some test runs with some other species, but not so much for honey production, more for the genetic side of things. Um, as I mentioned before, we're looking to do a lot of testing this coming season. Um, we're looking to go up to the Sunshine Coast and run around Silly up there for a week or so, testing as many plants as we can, especially on the polygal. Um, that'll be the one we're targeting up there. There's a patch of scoparium in the Grampians that we'll be looking at um, wandering out and certainly find some good plants in there as well. So we're looking to do a lot more nectar testing to find out um, if we can find a really, really high testing plants to keep breeding from down the track. Now, we've got four species this year. We're also looking at a couple of other species. Um, two that come to mind straight away is Lipnospermum penisonii, or the lemon center tea tree. This little guy's been used in the gardens for 30, 40 years and has been ticking away all over Australia. So his adaptability to Australian conditions and southeast Australian conditions is really, really good. Um, they're in Warrigal, if you see them around this time of the year. Um, they flower sort of at that January, February period as well. So it overlaps with the continentale. Um, the DHA levels across the average for the species is about 6,000. So it's a fair bit higher than the continentale. So if we can get another species which is going to test medical grade honey after Christmas, um, that'll sort of complete the picture for us. Um, the other one we're looking at is uh, a subspecies of the Polygalifolium. Uh, this one's also common name is the cardwall tea tree. You now we planted this guy about 30 years ago in our garden and he's just been ticking away merrily there. Um, we nectar tested him last, test, uh, last summer and he came in at about 5,500 DHA. So potentially he's got um, the resources there to be a medical grade honey. Now the other thing to notice here is he's an early flower. So he's a September, October flower. So that can potentially extend the flowering period where we can produce bioactive honey after six months with the inclusion of this species. Now it may be a little bit earlier, a bit too early for the bees to get really up and going and there might be too much else going on in the surrounding areas to make it a, a viable option for down here, but it could be useful for some you know, people up in New South Wales or other places. Um, we're doing quite a few of these talks. Uh, this one's number eight in about 10 I've got booked in at the moment. Um, so we're talking a lot to um, acreists and beekeepers such as yourselves. There's a lot of uh, sort of misinformation about how this is all going to work and whether it's going to work or whether it's a waste of time or not. Um, like anything, proper planning and proper resourcing will, will help things work. Uh, it's not just as simple as you know, sticking them down the paddock and you know, planting 10 trees and all of a sudden you're going to be producing medical grade honey. Um, that's just not going to happen. You do need you know, quite a few thousand of them in the, in the perfect world, probably about a hectare 
I would suggest, depending on how much you want to get out of it, um, the hectare would be about where I'll be looking at as the, the minimum area if you want to produce medical grade honey. And that'll also correlate to how many hives and that you want to run on it. So if you want to um, produce medical grade honey off a hundred hives, you're going to need a lot more than someone that's going to want to produce um, the, the honey off one or two hives. Um, this year we grew 30,000. We've got the potential to grow, grow more than that if we need to. Um, I don't know where this is going to end. So yeah, we'll go along for the ride and see where it all happens. And another thing we're looking at is the year-round year nutrition of the bees. So for beekeepers that are looking at picking their, their bees in the one spot rather than shifting around, that can work with people in a backwards and forwards type um, mechanism to make sure the bees have always got a little bit of a nectar flow and maybe the pollen as well coming through right through the year. So I've had enough trouble getting my head around the leptospermin one this, on, this, this year. Um, perhaps we'll look at that one next year and see if we can get a, a species mix that's suitable, almost tailored towards beekeepers. Um, so that you can also always have a bit of a, a flow happening. You're not always running into these little gaps where they draw down. How do yeah. they multiply themselves? Sorry? How, how does the plant multiply itself? Like seeds? Seeds, yeah. Although you can produce them from cuttings. We used to do some of the garden varieties years ago in cuttings. So if we got a plant to just test it off the scale, um, if you produce them by cutting, you're actually getting a genetic clone of that plant. If you're producing them from seed, there's going to be a little bit of variation because it's um, sexual reproduction as opposed to asexual, which is the cuttings. So so, uh, it's a little bit harder than that. Um, there's a, we grow them in hothouses when we're doing cuttings. So poly, polystyrene hothouses, like the ones just out here. Um, use a, a well-draining media that's not so well-drained, it doesn't hold moisture. Uh, perlite is what we've been using in the past. And there's yeah, some root, root promoting hormone, which you've also got to get at the right time of year. So you don't want to get the cuttings when they're flowering, because most of the energy is going into the seed pods and the flowers. Um, you want to get them around about this time of year when it's cooling off a bit, the wood's just hardening up and not fully hardened yet. That seems to be outright. Yeah. So you talked about complementary planting. Have you found anything that's a, a great pollen source but no nectar so you don't get the dilution factor? Yep. Um, the one that comes to mind straight away is Acacia and Plexa or the lightwood. So it's a wattle. So it'll produce zero um, nectar at all because the wattles don't produce nectar but they're a reasonable good source of um, pollen. And it happens to flower, it's a really late flowering wattle. So the silver wattles out here will be flowering the next month or so, and they'll go well before your tea tree is ready to flower. Whereas Acacia and Plexa um, will flower in that sort of January, February, um, December period. So there's potential there maybe to have uh, a few trees scattered through um, a plantation so they can produce a, a pollen source on site and without the need to supplement. I don't know where it's going to work, I've got no idea. No one's done it anyway. But that's just where my initial thoughts are they're heading in that direction. Um, most of the wattles do flower in winter, early spring. Um, there is another wattle that flowers just before that Christmas period, that's the black wattle, but it tends to be really, really fast growing and drops dead after about 15 years because the grubs get into it. Whereas the light wood, you know, very similar to the black wood in the, way, in the gray, way it grows, and that'll still be ticking over 30, 40, 50 years later as a, a small tree. It's also not, not going to take up too much space, too much energy, and too much shade as far as the, um, the shading of the, the tea trees go. So that's a possibility. You might even be able to stack them around the edge of a plantation or just have a strip every now and again. Um, not sure that's, that's how that's going to work in the, in the reality of it, but it's an option. So do they make a good wind barrier? Yeah. yeah. If you look outside um, where the, the bergens are, the tea trees are going to do a similar sort of thing. Um, except they're not going to drop as many seeds as what the burger will. So when you're driving up the highway towards Melbourne, you'll see just walls and walls of bergen on the side of the road. The tea trees won't be as dense as that because they're not, they hold onto their seeds a lot longer on the plants. They tend to be a more fire responsive colonizer, whereas the bergen drops the seeds every year. The pods open up when they're ripe and bang, you've got you know, another 50 bergens running around at the bottom of the, the parent tree. So yeah, they do make a good wind break. What sort of control do you use for the webbing one? Have you had like infestations at your... No. Uh, we, you might, on a, you know, we've got a, um, a few plants in the garden we sort of monitor and keep an eye on just to see how it's going to work. Um, there might be one plant, one little stem in a thousand that's got this caterpillar on it. So I don't think, unless it's really, really bad infestation, um, it's not going to be a problem, I don't think. 
the bigger the volume of plants when you start planting, like if you're going to plant out 10 hectares and you've got 10,000 plants instead of you know, a couple of hundred, that might have an effect because if you're producing a monoculture, that's going to have a more you know, explosive effect on pests if possible. Um, but if we're mixing up the species, these more open-leaved species like the Lanigerum and the Polygalophyllium, um, they're not as prone to it as the Scopariums and the Continentalis to be just because of their um, leaf structure. It seems to be a little more open and the, the caterpillars don't seem to go at them as much. So it could be that a, a mixed species plantation is going to be a better option than just you know, say, planting straight Scopariums. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, once again, jump in a round of applause for Rob.